So the title of this talk is Weird Machines Exploiting Turing Completeness. And uh, I'm going to take a bit of a, of, I'm going to take my time here to explain what a weird machine is because the concept is not very trivial. Um, so introducing myself for people who don't know me, uh, I've been, I, my name is Pedro Castillo. I've been coding since 2009, so it's been like 13 years now. I'm currently the CTO at Kumbuka, we're a fintech that allow the, we're like doing a, a joint account for 2022. Let's say um, you can like control your finances together with your family or your friends or anybody who pays stuff together with you. Where like if Splitwise actually allowed you to make payments and uh, some other and organize your finances. Uh, but other than that, I'm really obsessed with the theory of computation. And that's what led me uh, into the rabbit hole I'm going to talk about in this talk. So uh, I think like the, the easiest way to actually talk about um, the what we mean when we talk about a weird machine is understanding what's going on in uh, this print. So if you've ever used WhatsApp, You've probably seen some weird stuff like um, this message where if you touch the, the black point, then uh, the app actually hangs and sometimes crashes or some other stuff like messages that simply seeing them inside WhatsApp will crash your app and sometimes will actually throw it into a crash loop. So you actually need to reinstall it. And that's really weird, right? Because this is supposedly just text, right? Um, this at least should be just text. And uh, how can something that is just text uh, cause your cause you, cause your phone to crash or something like that? So there, so there are some messages like this um, and they look weird, right? But there isn't really anything here. It's supposedly just text. And uh, how can that make something really happen um, inside your, your app? So we actually need to answer a thing. So what is text, really? Uh, when we talk about uh, text inside a program, uh, what really is text? Uh, is there really just text? And how does that text get on your screen anyway? Because if you want to answer what's going on with those messages inside WhatsApp, we need to understand this process. Because the way that actually works is exploiting this process of how the text actually gets on your screen. So uh, it's very easy when you're using a computer to think like everything is just magical. Everything is um, just, uh, it just works, you know. Uh, you click on stuff on the screen and like you, we, we have these metaphors, right? Which we use to understand computers. And these metaphors are so powerful that sometimes we can forget they are metaphors at all. Like when you click on a button on the screen, you aren't really touching a button. You aren't really pressing anything. You're just pressing a button and uh, it's somehow connected to what you see on the screen, but it's really a big illusion. Like you're not pressing a button that does anything. There's like a process being triggered by the fact that you press it a button while your screen was showing a cursor within a certain area and whatever, whatever, whatever. So everything you do in a computer is behind like this tower of abstraction that uh, really means that there's a lot going on behind anything that happens. And uh, if we want to understand what a weird machine is, it's like we can hide machines in this process. We can hide little computers in the processes that happen behind like everyday things you do. So what's going on when WhatsApp actually renders text? You have this text data which gets sent to WhatsApp and uh, that goes over the network and eventually the, the, the app gets a message with a payload containing a UDF8 binary. And uh, then this gets sent to renderer code, which will actually use your operating systems, text rendering facilities to actually uh, eventually generate instructions, which will go to the GPU to update the frame buffer uh, that represents the screen with the data for those characters to show up. So uh, there's a lot that can happen here and uh, there's a lot of abstraction going on. So we have this idea, this metaphor that like you're, you're just getting a message and okay, right, it shows up. But there's really a lot going on down here and there's actually some parallels to some other stuff that you might have been doing on your computer. 
So what do you have here? We have like a binary, uh, some binary data that gets read by some code and that code based on that binary data will send some instructions somewhere for them to be executed. Uh, and it's easy to forget this. So like, it doesn't matter how declarative something is, in the end, everything inside the computer is imperative. Like it, the text only will show on the screen if there are imperative instructions going into your GPU and to tell it to update the frame buffer that is like uh, backing with the pixels that show on the screen. And uh, that actually has a really big parallel with something else, with how code gets interpreted, specifically uh, a script interpreted code. Um, yeah, Python is not really interpreted. It gets compiled to bytecode. But anyway, what you have is some data, uh, initially a UDF-8 binary, then some binary bytecode, uh, which gets processed by interpreter code, which sends instructions to the CPU. So this parallel here is really interesting, right? So you have like a renderer and an interpreter, uh, and they're both sending instructions somewhere. They're both causing side effects. They're both causing th things to happen. And uh, what's really the difference here? Well, the difference is that you don't expect WhatsApp to do stuff, to like uh, cause things that you experience as side effects, such as changing the state of stuff in your operating system or, uh, I, I don't know, like causing something outside of like text showing up in your screen to happen. But there's really nothing that stops that from happening other than the fact that WhatsApp doesn't want to do that. Uh, so WhatsApp could really just implement a feature where like if someone sends you Python code, it actually executes that Python code in an interpreter inside that app, the app and then it sends you the output as a message. They could do that. So really the only difference between what's going on with like WhatsApp and a Python interpreter is trust. You are trusting that WhatsApp only wants to be a messaging app. It only wants to get like some UDF-8 data and uh, send you and show you that as, uh, as a message. And that's OK. I mean, uh, all you want, uh, WhatsApp has no reason, really, to do something different than that. Because if they did, you wouldn't trust it anymore, and you wouldn't use that app anymore. So what's going on here? Uh, why does something happen, something you don't expect should happen when you just click a piece of text, which is something that really shouldn't do anything? Well, this opens up a bigger question, which we could say, we could phrase it as, what do your files do when you're not paying attention? Like when you open a file, what's really happening under there? What could happen under there? And uh, What's going to happen is that a lot of times we will have Turing completeness going on in systems where we don't expect Turing completeness to exist. So being very informal and not going into a lot of detail, Turing completeness is the ability of a system to simulate a computer. Uh, so if you have a system that can actually simulate a computer inside itself, that system is Turing complete. And uh, that means a lot of, it has a lot of consequences, but the main one is that like you have, a, uh, you have a language, it can be a very strange language, but you have a system of instructions that go on there and that somehow manipulates some notion of state according to rules. So like I said, you, may, you might have some very weird language, you might have some very weird ways of um, having input and output in that system, but uh, the idea here is that the system will be able to simulate a computer if you define input in an appropriate way, in a way that is consistent and can be read by the system you are using as a computer. And uh, you will have, and, uh, you will have uh, some definition of how output works so that you can uh, interpret the outputs of that system as the output of your computer. So the only practical difference you see are really not just trust. It's also the fact that the, the renderer code is not meant to be Turing complete. It's not meant to be able to do anything a computer is able to do. When you run a Python script, you expect it to be able to do anything a computer is able to do. You expect it to be able to run arbitrary computations. But the renderer code is not meant to do that. The only thing the renderer code is meant to do is making text show up 
on your device. But how do you guarantee that? And the answer most of the time is you don't, which means that if you have a format that is complex enough, your renderer or your interpreter of any kind or your file reading program can actually have some effects you don't expect. And uh, that's how a weird machine usually will be built. So how hard really is it for a system to become accidentally Turing complete? Like you're actually building your system and uh, you, you have no idea really like uh, if it's going to be Turing complete or not. You just wanted to do something simple, but it ends up being Turing complete. Well, a good example here is Conway's Game of Life. Some people might have actually heard it or played around with it, but the idea is that Conway's Game of, Game of Life is this game, uh, like a quote-unquote game, with very simple rules that can generate some very complex behavior. And the idea here, like if you look at this, like with the way these cells are updating, is that you only have four rules that determine everything that, happen on this, that happens on this board. And uh, the four rules are based in like each cell, each little pixel here can only see its eight neighbors. And uh, for e at each moment, the next state of a cell is decided on based on its eight neighbors. So um, the black cells here are alive and the white cells are in the dead state. So the idea is that if you have a cell that has less than two neighbors, so it has one or zero neighbors, then it will die. That's rule one. Rule two is if a cell has exactly two or three neighbors, um, it will, if a cell has, uh, actually, if a cell has exactly two or three neighbors and is alive, it will stay alive. If a cell has more than three neighbors and it is alive, then it dies. And if a cell is alive and it has exactly three neighbors, then this is all is dead, sorry, and it has exactly three neighbors, then it becomes alive. So as I was saying, we have Conway's Game of Life, which has these really simple rules, right? And uh, the fun thing here is that these rules are actually turning complete. So this is actually a CPU built in Conway's Game of Life. And of course, this works nothing like a real CPU. So you see these strings here that like look like cables or something like that. Those aren't really cables. Those are streams of little gliders, which are these tiny structures here, which we use to transfer data from one place to another. So even though this is completely different from a real life CPU, uh, it will actually work the same, the same because it's Turing complete, because it can simulate the same thing. You just need to think about input and output in different ways. And the thing is, Conway's Game of Life was not made to be Turing complete. But there is nothing special about RAM memory. There's nothing special about characters on a screen. If you can consistently interpret something and you can consistently manipulate it, you can use it to encode data. And if you have any system that has choice or rewriting mechanisms, like you, if you can choose based on the state of something what the next state should be, or you can rewrite parts of some state, like based on what that part of the state is, you can say what it should be in the future, then it's very likely you actually do have a Turing complete system there. And uh, what this means is that very simple systems are actually Turing complete. And uh, very simple systems like that can actually show up in many unexpected places. So like when it's, when I say rewriting, you can actually implement a Turing machine inside set. So you can build a script in set that's like it's only text replacement. And uh, if you provide it an input encoded in the way it expect, it will actually behave as a Turing machine. So um, it actually reads like from standard input and it writes the, uh, the output to STD out. And uh, that's just said, it's Turing, it's Turing complete. So when we ask how hard it is for a system to become accidentally Turing complete, it turns out it's pretty damn easy. Uh, it's actually harder to make a system not be Turing complete. You need to be pretty careful in what operations you allow a system to do. But what does that have to do with what we're talking about? So what about our text render, the text, the, the text render we were talking about when we started talking about this? 
So let's say you have a text render written in like any mainstream programming language. And most mainstream programming languages actually will use at least some functions from libc um, to implement some of their functionality because libc is very mature and it implements a lot of common functionality and it abstracts away a lot of, and you have a libc for nearly any operating system and it will abstract away a lot of uh, operating system calls. So it's very useful to be able to use libc. And you have this thing called a return into libc attack. Uh, which is a case where uh, an, an attacker will use a buffer overflow or other errors in your code to actually make your to actually make your code call libc functions in some predetermined way. Sometimes they won't even need to use an exploit or anything. They can just uh, build an input to your program so that it calls libc functions in a, in some way. And this is important because libc. Uh, has functions that can be used to implement a Turing complete system. So if you have a program where your attacker can craft input, like they can make input that is specifically made in order to force your program to call functions in libc in a way that they actually manipulate the state of a Turing machine, like the, uh, they can actually make your program compute things for them. They can actually turn your program into an interpreter. And that's what a weird machine is. A weird machine is uh, pretty much an interpreter that is being made out of a program that is not supposed to be an interpreter. And uh, returning to libc, libc attacks are one way of doing that, but there are many other ways of actually making it happen. And I'm going to actually give some real life examples of this. So when I talk about all this stuff about turning machines and uh, how you can, you need to be careful that you're not making your system turn complete by accident, because if you do, it's going to be really hard to avoid some kinds of attacks. Um, that uh, that actually. It can seem like, oh, that's just a lot of academic, academic stuff. It's sort of like, the, oh, some ivory tower mumbo jumbo. But that's not really true. This is actually something that has been used in the real world to attack real systems. And uh, attacks using this can be really nasty and really hard to deal with, exactly because they're using your program just in the way your program was intended to work. So even if we trust the intent of the code, like when we look at WhatsApp, we know that like WhatsApp is meant to be a messenger. We know that the devs of WhatsApp don't want WhatsApp to be able to do bad things to your computer. But if they leave corner cases in there, those corner cases might be exploited, just doing things that the program is expected to handle. So that's what a weird machine is. A weird machine is a situation where we have a, a system, we have a system that takes some kind of input, and we can craft input to actually make that system behave in ways that we want it to behave, and that are against the will of some person using that system. And uh, there are some a lot of cases of this. You don't really actually need Turing completeness for this every time. But if you have Turing completeness, the attacks can be very much worse and very hard to deal with. So what's going on in our WhatsApp example, after all? So you have this message with a black point, right? And you look at it, and it seems like uh, it seems pretty inoffensive. Like it's just a black point and a message. But if you take this message, it's actually Unicode data. And if we get this Unicode data and we throw it into an HTML converter, which is going to make the Unicode characters visible, what is actually being sent to you is this. And uh, you, you see these characters that are like LRM, RLM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what are these characters? Unicode has a feature where you can throw in an invisible character that says to Unicode, OK, from here on, the text direction is changing. So if you have like mixed Latin and Hebrew text, for instance, or mixed Latin and Arabic text, you, you, the, Latin, the, the Latin text, it wants to go from right to left, and the Arabic text, it wants to go from, uh, wants to go from left to right, sorry. And the Arabic text, it wants to go from right to left. So the way you tell um, the, 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 the text renderer to change the direction it, render, it renders the text in 
is that you send in this character, uh, RLM or LRM, which are a uh, right-left marker and left-right marker, to say, okay, from here on, this text is going to be either right to left or like Arabic or left to right, like Latin text. And when you click text in WhatsApp, you're actually going to select it. Um, it's how it works by default. So for you to be able to select text, um, the renderer actually needs to know which direction the text is going in. So it knows like, should I select to the right or to the left? So it's pretty simple what's going on here. It's just that um, the text renderer is looking, okay, this person wants to select text, but I have this bunch of left, right markers. So now I actually need to process all of them to know which direction this text is going to go in and which direction I should select in. And since you have a lot of them, uh, this is actually exploiting a weakness in the text renderer because uh, the, the handling of left to right and right to left text is actually pretty complex in Unicode. So they're using the fact that they know that that is pretty complex to make your, your phone deal with a pretty complex operation, which is going to take a lot of time and a lot of memory and uh, will eventually make your, your app crash. So this is actually pretty innocuous, all things considered. The worst it can do is like make your app hang or crash, which isn't, which isn't even close to the worst things that can happen when you have a program interpreting some input you don't expect. So what kinds of other payloads could we craft? What kinds of payloads could we craft like if we really have a Turing complete situation, if we really have the ability to run pretty much arbitrary code, base it on what's going on based on what's going on inside uh, the program. So there's this XKCD that I think it represents pretty well, actually, how text stacks work. So you need to assume that pretty much everything is compromised, that pretty much everything has some kind of vulnerability. And uh, only the fact that you have control over input and output and you can decide how to handle input and output is what is stopping really your code from being exploited. So how do you actually craft a weird machine payload? You need to reverse engineer the program. You need to figure out a set of functions that is Turing complete or that can do something that is against the will of the user. And then you implement a payload that acts as a program for that Turing complete machine. And that way you can turn anything into a scripting engine as long as it, has, it exposes some set of operations that are triggered by input that turn out to be Turing complete. But you can only do things that program is allowed to do, right? So if you have WhatsApp, the, the worst things that could happen are like you could render some text, you could make it hang, but uh, you couldn't really like uh, if you if you don't have like the the message sending function exposed in response to some input, you can't really force the user to send a message or anything like that. Well, yeah, but that's where the fact that everything has very likely exploits that can be used comes into play. Because you have stuff like Rowhammer, where you can write memory you have no permission to write based on hardware bugs. So if you do a lot of writes really fast, you can usually corrupt some memory in different locations. So, um, and most code will eventually write memory. Like when you modify a variable, that's probably going to be a memory write. So uh, it's very rare that you get access to some code that runs in response to input that can't write memory, for, for instance. You have good old buffer overflows, which are the base of most exploits, really, where you can actually um, run code outside of the boundaries of the code that really should run. You can actually change variables to make you access things that you shouldn't be able to access. And uh, if you have that together, with uh, some Turing completeness, you can do some really bad stuff. We're going to talk about a real world example about that soon enough. And like the WhatsApp example, you can do a denial of service, you can make an application crash, and that's no big deal if it's WhatsApp, you know, it's going to be a bit annoying, you're, going, you're not going to be able to send messages for a few minutes, or maybe you'll have to reinstall it. But it's not the end of the world. But what if this is critical software? What if this is something running, let's say, in a financial institution, or this is something running in a hospital, or this is something running anywhere that you, like in a factory? 
And uh, the halting problem means that we actually can't detect these reliably if you actually have Turing complete uh, operations in response to input. So detecting input that, that would trigger a denial of service, that would trigger a crash, uh, is actually not possible for the general case. If you have very specific cases, okay, you can do it. But in the general case, you would need to solve the halting problem, and that is proved to be impossible. So this is just a way in which you can see like these kinds of, uh, of attacks, they can be very nasty. You also have side channel attacks where you can actually uh, read the contents of memory you're not allowed to without doing any memory reads. So there's a lot of stuff that can happen and uh, I'm not a security expert. I don't know like a full list of what could happen here, but if someone has control of operations inside your program and uh, they actually manage to build a, a, a payload that acts as a script inside your program, they could do a lot of stuff. And uh, they would mostly need other vulnerabilities, but those are everywhere. This, the, the entire tech stack is compromised. That's just a fact. So now that we have a bit of an idea of what weird machines are, how they behave, and what they can make happen, I want to talk a little bit about some actual uh, some actual uh, weird machines in the in the real world, and there has been a high profile example of a weird machine actually being used to exploit um, actually to exploit actual machines in the wild, which is the NSO zero click exploit, which was discovered I think in 2021, and uh, NSO is an Israeli company that they uh, sell a spyware to government. That's really their business. So um, they sell tools that allow governments to spy on people's phones and to get data from that. And they actually developed this very ingenious exploit that it's very, it's, it's very impressive because um, it's actually a zero-click exploit. You don't need to do anything like to activate it. Most exploits, you need to click a, a URL that will that will actually send you some payload that initiates the, the, the exploit. But in this case, it, you don't need to do anything. It's just a message that they send you, and you receive it, and your iPhone is compromised. So how does that work? Uh, so this exploit is known as forced entry. And uh, it, it, it's a way to infect iPhones with spyware by simply sending an image via, via iMessage. And uh, the user doesn't even have to open the image. In fact, the image, it's broken. It doesn't show anything. It just shows like a message with no content. And uh, the moment you receive it, that message, you're bombed. You, you, you're, you're, um, they've already gotten a, a malware payload into your iPhone and there's nothing you can do about it. And it's been fixed in the latest versions of iPhone, but in, of iOS, sorry. But um, it, it's really, it's really scary because this is a case we know of, right? But there could be a lot more of these in the wild, and uh, it's we don't know if we're safe or not. So how can this work? So there's this article from Google Project Zero um, where they actually really dissected it, and most of what I'm going to show. Uh, right now is based on this article, and I encourage everyone to go read it later. It's really good, and uh, it doesn't really require a lot of domain-specific knowledge. If you understand a bit about uh, computer memory, you can understand. You can mostly follow what's going on. But, okay, so what, what's the idea here? So this exploit was actually discovered by examining the phone of a, of a Saudi activist, and uh, they figured out what was going on with it. So what's the idea here? <clears throat> Whenever you get sent a file in iMessage with the .gif extension, and I'm going to say gif, I will fight you, that is the right way to pronounce it. Um, it's going to call this function. So the syntax here can be a bit weird if you don't know Objective-C, but this is essentially just called, this, this, this is the same as doing like um, the class name, dot, method, and those are the arguments. Uh, so it's, it's calling this function that copies a GIF from a path to another path. So what they're doing is like, uh, you, oh, you're getting this, this GIF, it's, uh, in your, it's, it's in some folder, they're going to copy it to your images folder. But the issue here is that the way this function works, and I don't know why it was, why it was implemented this way, maybe just laziness, maybe they just wanted to reuse code, but the, what it actually does is it opens the GIF file 
and it runs the renderer to actually render it into a new GIF file. And that's where the issue starts. Because like I said, if you have a text renderer, it needs to run some instructions, some side effects based on the content of the text. And here it's the same thing. The renderer needs to run some instructions based on the content of the GIF. But notice that I said when iMessage gets a file with the GIF extension, it doesn't mean that the content that, of something that has a GIF extension is necessarily a GIF. So what happens here? There's a, the, part of the issue here is that Core Graphics, which is like iOS's framework for rendering anything, um, it doesn't really care about the extension of files. It uses the magic number from the file data. And the data of that GIF was actually a PDF that contained a JBIG2 image. So what the hell is a JBIG2 image? That's probably something most people really haven't seen. So the idea here is that JBIG2 is a very old compression, it is a very old image compression format that is mostly made for scans of black and white images. And the idea of how it works is that it will look so you usually have like these scans and they will be mostly text, right? And text is going to be repetitions of just the same letters. So what JBIG2 does is it searches for similar areas in an image and it says, oh, okay, this is showing up a lot in this image. This is probably a letter. So what it will do is for each area where this, uh, this pattern is repeated, like for where, where it's very similar to one another, instead of, staring, of, of storing the pattern, what it, what it will do is storing a single instance of the pattern. And then for each time it appears, it stores the difference and then it can apply a lot of, uh, then it can apply Boolean operations on the original and the difference in order to re reconstruct the original pattern. And that saves a lot of space. Uh, it was very popular for uh, scan for scanning machines in uh, the early 90s. It's not really used anymore, but because it was so popular, uh, Core Graphics actually has a renderer for it. And um, the idea here is that the decoder that Apple uses is open source, and uh, it contained the buffer overflow, overflow vulnerability. So like I said, usually, um, you will need to have some other vulnerability in order to exploit the uh, weird machine. But in this case, there was this buffer overflow and they could use this to set the end of the bitmap to a huge address. And, uh, they, and it actually allowed them to uh, modify the bitmap data itself in order to set it up in a very specific way. So now you have a decoder that can write anywhere. But that's not really, really useful. Like if you have a, 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 buffer, a, a buffer overflow exploit in JavaScript, for example, um, okay, you would now have like this big array in JavaScript and you can write into it using JavaScript. But here you're inside an image decoder. So how are you going to write? How are you going to actually read that memory in order to be able to figure out what's in it and how, what you need to do to actually um, get the to get the phone to actually uh, download your malware payload and actually run it. So the idea here, and it's really, really clever, is that they make a weird machine inside the decoder. And the key here is what I said, like the, the, the JBIG2 image format, it stores these segments, they call it, that are like repeated pieces of the image that have very small difference to other parts of the image and uh, they store the sequence of operations, of Boolean operations you need to do on that data in order to um, compute what you should write into the memory in order to recover the final image. So you have Boolean operations and you have this very carefully manufactured image. It's not really an image, it's actually a script which uh, uses these Boolean operations to actually build a weird machine and make it run instructions inside your computer while the, the while the phone actually thinks it's just decoding an image. It's just doing what it should do in order to decode an image. But what it's really doing is running a script. And what's the issue here? If you have AND and XOR, and you definitely have both of those in order to reconstruct a JPEG2 image, you have NAND. 
And this is how you build an NAND gate from an NAND and XOR from NAND and XOR gates. And if you have NAND, as anyone who has studied computer architecture knows, you have a full computer. So what they actually did was build a computer into this image payload that uh, includes it included like registers. It had a 20-bit adder. It was really impressive, and uh, they actually used this virtual machine in order to uh, embed a scripting, uh, effectively what was a scripting language, into the image data and do arbitrary code execution using the image decoder. And the image decoder, it actually ran with some degree of trust from the operating system. So it was able to access some areas of the operating, or some areas that were reserved by the operating system. So it would use the Objective-C dynamic code execution facilities to delete the fake GIF file that started a process. And then it would use some more vulnerabilities, which were only accessible to code with, with elevated privileges to start get, running some code in a different process that had even more privileges using inter-process communication, which fully allowed it to, ex, to escape the app sandbox. And then it would download a malware payload and make the operating system run it. So now you're pawned. And you didn't do anything. You just, got, you just received a message containing a fake GIF and that fake GIF turned your decoder into an interpreter, this turned the image decoder into an interpreter and made that interpreter uh, pawn your own phone. So you don't need to do anything. You have no way to defend against it. And once again, this is everywhere. Everything is compromised. Everything has vulnerabilities that if you have a Turing complete uh, set of instructions inside any kind of program that can be triggered by input, eventually someone will find a way to build a computer inside your program and use that to take over uh, the computer where it is running. So that is an actual example, example of a weird machine in the wild, but uh, there are many places where weird machines can be. And some examples are in ELF metadata. So I'm going to cite some papers here that are quite interesting. Most of them are explaining some way, some proof of concept in order to build weird machines in different kinds of file formats that really show how um, everywhere you're really able to build during complete systems and actually force uh, computers to run code they have, they have no idea they are running. So in this case, like in the ELF file is the executable file which most Linux distributions use. And uh, the idea here is that the ELF files, they have these symbol tables, which are instructions for the dynamic linker. So right, when you said you have a dynamically linked library, then um, the ELF file actually has some instructions to tell the dynamic linker how to get that file and uh, actually load it into memory. And what they did here uh, is that they figured out that there are a few instructions that the dynamic linker runs, which are actually equivalent to brainfuck if you set them up the right way, and actually build a compiler that makes like an ELF file that actually runs a brainfuck program. Another case of a weird machine is page faults. So this one is actually, it, it, it could be used for some pretty nasty exploits because how do anti-malware anti programs detect malware? They usually will look for certain sequences of instructions or they will look for certain, they will look for patterns they know that could represent malware. But in this case, when you have page faults, you're actually computing without any kind of instruction. What you're really doing is just setting up memory tables that uh, specify how the operating system should handle page faults. And uh, they just make a sequence of page faults happen and they prepare the tables in the memory in such a way that you can build what we would call a one instruction computer, which is like, uh, it just keeps repeating one instruction over and over. But if the data is built the proper way, you, this is actually, it, it can actually execute any program. And finally, this last example, I'm actually not really sure that it's Turing complete. I, I suspect it is because um, it has, a, fonts have a very powerful replacement system and uh, so there is this very interesting uh, program that was published in uh, Page Fault magazine in 2019, which is Spooky Fizzbuzz, which is essentially um, a Python program that all it does is open a graphical window and output numbers uh, from one to infinity. It just keeps writing numbers, right? 
So the spooky part is that you can actually check the program and that's all it does. It, lo it, it loads a graphical window, but when you look at the graphical window, um, it, it's actually fizzbuzz. Like when it writes three, it says fizz. When it writes five, it says buzz. And uh, the program is just outputting numbers. So the way this works is that it, it actually loads a font in order to show the numbers that uh, it contains ligature instructions. So what are ligature instructions? If you So there's an example here, like if you write FFI, it actually connects the characters and a font actually has to have instructions to do that. So it needs to say, oh, if you see this sequence of characters, then you need to replace it by this character or this sequence of characters. And this is very important. Like you have, um, if you have Arabic scripts where uh, characters need to all connect to each other, some Indian scripts too, the characters need to connect and you have some pretty complex replacements, like especially in Arabic, um, I know like, uh, you have characters that will be different if they are at the end of a word. So this logic needs to be very powerful. And uh, the idea here is that this file, it specifies some replacement tables that it actually, they actually implement a state machine that it figures out every time you write a character, if that character is a multiple of three, a multiple of five, or a multiple of both three and five, and it actually replaces that character by fizz or buzz or fizzbuzz. And uh, this, uh, this, this paper, it actually asks a really cool question, which is, could a font be malicious? Like, we're just making a toy here, we're just playing around, but what if a font would replace one word with another, like in rare occurrences, or if it had logic inside of it to detect medical dosages, or if it had logic in it to detect financial information? So what should we take out from this? First thing is we need to be very careful about opening interested data of any kind. It doesn't matter if data seems harmless. Uh, if, if, it ha if it has a sufficiently complex uh, logic in order to process it and show something to the user, you could be, re you could be opening yourself up to a uh, specially crafted input that would force you to, to force your program to run some sort of code you don't expect. And even if your data is sandboxed, even if there is no way for those instructions to actually escape the, the little space you run your app in, you can still get a nasty denial of service. And if your code is actually critical, then that can be really bad, obviously. And when you see how some kind of file format is processed, you should be really suspicious of choices of rewriting of Boolean operations, because all of that can be signs that there is a weird machine lurking inside your code. Always validate file types. This is, uh, <laughs> so we have the NSO example, right? Where um, they actually send you a GIF and it's not a GIF. And uh, that's really a simple vulnerability, but it's something uh, programmers want to do most of the time. And there's a lot of issues with that. like. Um, iOS usage have some issues with XML because so like iOS uses XML a lot for configuration. And um, what happened was that different parts of the operating system use a different XML parsers and uh, those parsers, they, they interpreted some constructs differently and there were some really nasty vulnerabilities because of that. So um, be really careful about file types and how they are treated. And I think one of the most important things is that every program should have the least power possible in order to uh, execute its function. So really, you shouldn't be giving a program the ability to do powerful operations. Like once again, the NSO exploit, it could only happen because when you were copying a GIF inside a program, you're really rendering a GIF. So it, that actually triggered the renderer and that's where all hell broke loose. And finally, like I said before, language theoretic security, which is this idea that uh, we should consider input uh, for any program really as being like a programming language and consider it uh, and try to analyze really how much power it has if it is really turning complete. That isn't an ivory tower issue. It's been used in real life. It's probably being used right now. Like we, we know that, that NXO exploit because that was the one Google Project Zero caught but we don't know how many exploits are out there that no one has understood how they work yet. And it's probably a really big number. And one thing that I would like everyone to take away, um, if you're going to take away just one thing from this talk is that only simple formats can ever be safe. If you try to make your file formats really smart, you're probably opening yourself up to security vulnerabilities. 
Um, it's better to have a simple program with a simple file format that doesn't try to do anything fancy if you can um, to have in a really complex file format with that, like um, you need to do a lot of really fancy instructions to reconstruct the data that is, that is in there. Um, so if you really need to have a complex file format, if you're doing something like audio and you need a, sp a special encoding, then you should be really, really, really careful about what kinds of operations you're doing. And that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm available for questions now. Thank you. I was looking to the chat. Uh, we had many comments, but I don't think we had uh, a, a specific question. If, if anyone is going to throw one now. And the talk was great. It's nice to think that everything you interact, there's almost like a live ecosystem of things making that work. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it, it's, 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 it's really fascinating and sort of scary at the same time. Um, yeah, Microsoft Office is really a bad one about that. It's really a huge offender. <laughs> oh, it's fun. Well, thanks, Dan Castillo. Uh, it was a really nice talk. If anyone wants to talk with him, he answers a lot. Thanks for people. inviting me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm a, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter and my GitHub are on the screen. And uh, I'll be here for a while. Nice. Anyway, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Castillo. Uh, so I think, Bruno, if you're here, you can, you can join me, maybe. OK, I hello. So, okay, hello, everybody. And Bruno, thanks for the invite for doing this, the, the hosting part. And I'll leave with you now. Thanks. I'll be here if you, if you need. Okay, so no, I will be very short because I'm tired as well for the holidays. A lot of content, they might blow moments, surprise about computer, crazy stuff. Okay, so I just have a very simple announcement okay, that. Uh, the upcoming Confed edition will be back to Brazil again. So the next edition will be in Sao Paulo. I don't know exactly when or when the Coffee Fapes will be open or the date, the venue, etc. But you have sure that the next edition will be back to Brazil, Sao Paulo. And if you want to be the update that when it will be open, it's up at the Coffee Fapes and so on, please follow us on Twitter and the LinkedIn as well, our social medias. And thank you for thank you.